fighting with our closets, let's stop hating our closets. Consider the next nine steps to be couples counseling with your wardrobe. We will go over wardrobe planning and shopping so that we make sure that whatever you purchase belongs in your closet and whatever clothes you need actually exist in your closet. So no matter where you are in your personal style journey or what style systems have been working for you, we will continue to hone, adjust, and tweak both your personal style goals and your wardrobe. Are we there yet? Uh, no! Are we there yet? No! Even when you think you found the perfect symbiotic relationship between what you actually want to look like and your closet contents, it will be a journey forever. That's not said to put a damper on your fashion enthusiasm. In fact, it should do the opposite. Your style is a never ending opportunity to express yourself, to be seen and assist you in accomplishing your goals and who you want to be. Now you may be exploring your body type, exploring your style essence, or even creating your personal style maps. And then you hit a wall, nothing works. It's not melding, it's not expressing, it's just a hot mess. Spend less and gain more. Number one. What is the grasp you have on your personal style? So first, make sure you have a good understanding of your personal style goals and that they are practical to your lifestyle. I like to use the personal style map for this. I go over this in this video here, but it helps you to pick visual aesthetics and items that have stood the test of time and continue to visually resonate with you. Let's break down my personal style map and how you can apply physical items in your closet to your map. Remember, these are not just mood boards. And remember, we need those fashion basics as well in our closet, which I go over in this video. But ultimately, your fashion basics are the road within your fashion town. Each image on your board should correlate to an item in your closet or an aesthetic goal that you have. And really only you can dictate what those images mean. Here's my board. Let's dive into the personal style maps and why they aren't just mood boards. These images represent my history and goals as a person and as a style aesthetic. This image, the flat to fluffy image, represents my desire to look casual, relaxed, and friendly. This is included in my hairstyling ideas, but also in terms of clothing, it's represented by looser fabrics, open necklines, easygoing silhouettes, nothing too polished. But then there's these images, my love of corsets, that has remained true to me for as long as I can rem remember. We are all unique individuals with a unique recipe for our own personal style, and my love of corsets will be a forever stay in my wardrobe. So how do I pair the corsets with the easygoingness? Well, I experiment, I tweak, and I find the balance between easygoing elements and a more structured fit, the corset in this case. These two images, to me, mean a 70s style influence. I love the 70s silhouette, the prints, and some of the colors, even if they aren't always in my palette. This image, I love the neckline, the easygoing romantic vibes, and I think that overall it works really well for a flamboyant natural with a romantic essence. So let's look for more of this blend. This image is a bit of masculine edge or angular lines or oversized pieces that I like to throw in the mix. And the Rothko painting, simply because I love what it stands for. The concept that people were meant to just stare at it and shed any preconceived notions or intellectual interpretations and just allow the painting to elicit an emotional response. I think that's an amazing challenge and one I would love to carry over into fashion. Instead of how does this outfit look or communicate or socially signal to the world, what does it make the wearer feel? What does it make the viewer feel? I like to think about that when I get dressed. So from my style map, we can see that I go with relaxed and romantic silhouettes with a 70s style influence. My style adjectives or how I want to be perceived include creative, friendly, and romantic. And I've taken my body comfort into consideration and marked what elements of my body I like to highlight, my shoulders, my vertical line, what parts of my body I'm neutral about, and what parts of my body I don't like to emphasize. For me, it's my stomach. This isn't about micromanaging our bodies or being critical of them, but instead meeting ourselves where we are at. It would be wonderful to be at a place where we love, respect, and honor every aspect of our bodies. And that is certainly the goal. But if you're not there yet, and I would put myself in this category as well, you can practice body neutrality and embrace the parts you love while allowing yourself to come to terms with the parts you might not want your, your style to highlight. Finding your seasonal color palette or understanding how you like to use color in your wardrobe is next. Simply exploring whether you are warm or cool tone can drastically, drastically impact your shopping habits. I have a TikTok video I'll link below to help you get started on that. The amount of times I've almost bought something but then realized that it was not in a cool tone color has saved me so much money. 
But if you're not into seasonal color, that's totally cool too. I suggest you understand how you like to use color in your wardrobe. Do you prefer a color heavy wardrobe, neutrals, stark contrast? Do you like people to notice you first or notice the color first? Deciding these factors may seem like a lot, and they do take some time to hone and refine, which is why your personal style should be a journey. So should you start shopping for your wardrobe if you don't have all of these elements figured out? Yes, but you should do so slowly. I have yet to find one case in all of my years of fashion and styling where buying a whole new wardrobe was ever well advised or created the desired result. The more you've honed your personal style, the more you can make changes to your closet essentials and your shopping list. But if you only have one or two of these elements cemented, start by adding just one or two pieces to your wardrobe and test them out first. Okay, next, understanding your fashion literacy. So whether you consider yourself a lover of classic fashion or a trendy fashionista, what you don't realize, your purchases are in fact influenced by the fashion curve or the fashion trend cycle. The fashion curve looks a little bit something like this. You have your introduction phase, usually introduced by a designer or the runway previews. You have your rise, the item starts to convert to reach a more mass audience and becomes more affordable, slightly easier to find. You have your peak, the item reaches peak popularity and it becomes affordable and pretty much available to everyone. And you have your fall, which is fairly swift. Everyone who wants it has it and it fades from popularity. This happens fairly fast. Sounds kind of simple, right? When an item hits its peak, it has less wear time left and should generally be avoided. Now, if we factor in fashion trends and classic pieces into this mix, the graph looks a little bit something like this. Fashion trends or fads have a much shorter lifespan, usually centering on introduction and never really hitting mass appeal or their peak when we think about the entire world. Something like Prada's Micro Mini would be a fad that fits this cycle. It's everywhere, really fast, appeals to a small set of, subset of the population. There's a media blitz, but ultimately we won't see herds of real people wearing it. Classics tend to have a longer term plateau. They don't rise or fall or drastically fall in or out of fashion. And depending on the piece, some small changes may be evolved over time, but the general silhouette generally stays relevant. A trench coat, for instance, always popular, never in or out, but the pocket size, the hem, the weight, may shift from season to season. So we want to understand our lifestyle needs, our climate needs, and our personal style goals to make the right decision on which classics fit us best and what trends might be applicable to our seasonal wardrobe in small doses. Now, fast fashion has disrupted or rather quickened this pace quite a bit. We have trends fall in and out before a fashion house can even put it out onto the runway. So the introduction phase now looks something a little bit more like this, with social media influence creating several fad spikes very early on. I think it's wonderful people are finding new fashion communities and like-minded people to share trends and interests with. But you really need to have a good understanding of your own style and your own personal aesthetic. Otherwise, you get whim swept into fast fashion binging and you just keep purchasing and pur purchasing without ever understanding why it works or doesn't work. So how can you do this? Number three, window shopping, online shopping, and wardrobe planning. Okay. You know what you want your style to be and you understand how the fashion curve works. Now, if you're unsure about how classic or trendy your style goals veer, I suggest you go back to your personal style maps and start noting from your item list which ones veer more classic and which ones veer more trendy. Theoretically, you shouldn't have an overwhelming amount of fads on your board because these images are images that have been important or impactful to you for a very long time. That's the whole point of the personal style map. It's historical data of your interests, but it can still help you confirm this. Be sure to refer back to them. Now, how do you catch an item early in the trend cycle and how do you vet it to match your personal style board? Find one or two trusted fashion advisors or fashion resources that serve your, the aesthetic you want. Now, selection is key to this. If you go with a blog or website or magazine, it's usually a bit easier, but you'll see a bit more of the extreme iterations of the trends, like this. If you opt for an influencer, keep in mind that their styles are often very heavily influenced by the trend cycle, which can lead you on a spendy adventure trying to keep up. Just be advised. Social media can help you find your advisors and help, can help you keep an eye out for pieces you might want to integrate. But just like all of my advice, use your data and go slowly. So for me personally, I follow one or two accounts online that speak to my aesthetic goals and my fashion beliefs and my consumption habits. These accounts often tell me upcoming trends and they also showcase a personal style that I feel has some overlap with mine. So whenever I stumble upon a post or image or item I'm liking or wondering whether it will go 
in my personal closet, I essentially dog ear it. I'm not purchasing, I'm watching. I have a folder on my social media labeled interesting fashion potential and I save it in there. After two weeks to about a month, I go in there and remove any items I forgot were even there or the initial sparkle has just worn out. Then I bet the item against my fashion parameters to see if I'm chasing a trend or finding a harmonious element to add into my wardrobe. Let's look at what this actually looks like. So for instance, this picture was in my file, specifically the fisherman sandals. Now let's look at how I would responsibly vet these pieces. Do they fit my personal style map? Hmm, not directly. While I like menswear pieces and some chunky attributes, I'm not sure this is what I was visualizing. Next, do they highlight a part of my body that I like? My feet are generally a neutral body part for me, but I'm more concerned about how these sandals will disrupt my visual line. I like a long vertical line and the highlight length, and I imagine with dresses, skirts, or shorts, these sandals would be a very heavy visual weight at the bottom of my outfit. Next, color-wise, they fit into my color palette and they are generally neutral, so they would go with enough pieces in my current closet, but they're not really adding much. Why do I like them? I like that they have an edgy feel, but ultimately that edginess will probably be lost when this trend hits the rise peak phase. Can I think of three to five outfits they would pair easily with within my current wardrobe? Normally this is a crucial step, but I pretty much already confirmed that these sandals are a pass for me. I like them because they look cool on this person, and that's okay. That doesn't mean I need them in my closet or that my credit card needs a $300 charge on it. Number four, budgeting for your seasonal shopping. This may not seem like the most fun part about personal style, but it actually is really important and can have a huge impact on your relationship with your clothes. If you're always feeling guilty because you splurge on this item or need to chuck that item because you actually don't like it, eventually you'll just have bad feelings towards your closet. And we don't want that. Now your budget for your style should ideally be defined each season. This will allow you to fill your, in your closet with your needs, replace any pieces, and integrate one or two trends if you want. This budgeting approach is assuming that you have most of your wardrobe basics in place. True basics, the simple streamlined go-to pieces that are the roads in your fashion town. Remember this? Yes, this. If you don't have those pieces in place, then you need to start there with a yearly budget. Create a budget for the year and a list of basics you need in your wardrobe and slowly invest in them over the course of a year. You can certainly try to get them on sale, but ultimately you want to invest in quality fit and fabric first. But a quarterly budget is usually the easiest to manage for everyone else. Now, what should that number be? That depends a little bit on how expansive your closet is, how varied your lifestyle needs are, and your financial status and income. To get some data on this, you could use your banking app or an app like Mint to see how much you spend on clothing in the last year. Assuming there were no big outliers like a Chanel purse splurge, this could be a good baseline. Now, if you see the number and a little part of you dies inside, <laughs> Well, then start evaluating those purchases. How many of them were solid investments? How many of those purchases do you still wear? And how many were a hem, maybe not the best of choices? Let's spend, say you spent $800 on clothes last year and you'd like to get it down to 500 and you see you make a lot of small but frequent fast fashion impulse buys. Eliminating those would be your first step. Vetting quality and lifestyle will be the second, so let's discuss this. One quick note, spending quickly usually leads to mistakes and I really don't recommend buying pieces if you don't have a sound payment plan in place or you don't have the cash to cover it. Number five, quality and lifestyle needs checkpoint. Okay, now the item has passed all of your checks, you've integrated it into your budget, and everything is looking good. Now before you hit buy, we need to make sure that the quality is worth it, and it truly achieves your lifestyle needs. Let's vet the quality of an item. Just because it is expensive does not mean that it's made well or made to last. This is where a bit of sewing or fashion construction knowledge can really come in handy. We want to be looking at the zippers, buttonholes, stitching, hems, and linings for indicators of quality. If you want this investment to last you and you're allocating your budget on this item, it's wise to make sure it's going to look polished and last. Things to avoid, puckering at the seams, bad construction, which usually means a bad fit, prints that are wildly misaligned at the seams, usually means not a lot of thought was put into the pattern placement, crooked stitching, which means careless construction, loose threads or hems that are messy or that droop, and stitching that doesn't look neat or even. I understand that sometimes our budget constraints may lead us to more affordable fashion selections, and some of these quality checks may be unavoidable. 
So checking your garment for quality can also just help you get the best item within your budget and perhaps you give, give you some pause if it's going to be a basic you want to last. The quality also needs to match your lifestyle needs and your budget may help you direct these purchases as well. If you live in a climate that hits below freezing regularly in winter, well then the quality and durability of your winter coat and boots needs to be prioritized and potentially your budget reallocated to consume this extra cost. Likewise, if your day consists of a lot of sitting and then standing and then sitting and you don't want to wage war on your trousers or jeans by 5 p.m., then maybe fit will be an important quality factor to consider. Number six, understanding fit. I don't know how many times I can say it, but taking those daily photos of your outfits will produce the most valuable data points, including when it comes to evalu evaluating the fit of an item. So what should we be looking at when we try something on? Well, it depends on the item and its purpose in your wardrobe. If you're working out, it might need more flexibility and stretch than your go-to pair of jeans. But ultimately, we want them to be comfortable and fit properly. Hmm. Please, I beg you, just ignore all sizing. It's all crap. As someone who has graded patterns for my own brand and for other brands, I assure you there is no standardization of sizing across the fashion industry, none. And usually not even within a brand. So don't get frustrated if you're always a size eight, but sometimes in Zara, the eight jeans don't fit. It's them not you. So you went shopping, you tried on a bunch of pieces. This can be done online. Just make sure that there's a good return policy so that you can return what doesn't work. And keep in mind the sizing charts can be super helpful when selecting your items if you're shopping online. You tried the pieces, you took the photos. What are we looking for? We want to check for any gaping or any squeezing. So drastic pull lines along the hips or big gaps along the waist all indicate it doesn't have a great fit. Next, if it has pleats, vents, or a slit, that it lays flat and isn't being pulled open. Usually along your hips, you want to be able to grab a little bit of fabric. It shouldn't be so snug that you can't even pinch a little, unless it has a huge stretch content. There should be some give through the hips to waist. Similarly, you shouldn't have to suck in or lay on the floor to button your pants. You want to be able to stick one to two fingers in your waistband and still breathe. Shoulders look appropriate for the style of jacket. For a more classic fit, the shoulder seam should hit about one fourth or one inch past your shoulder edge. If it's oversized, this may not apply, obviously. Check for hems, both sleeves and pants, and check that it is the look you are going for. Does the pant hem hit the ground? Will it still hit the ground if you're wearing heels? Does the blouse hit your wrist bone or is it too short or too long? Avoid pockets that gape like this and you should be able to appropriately move in the pieces. Now it is important to test the fit and movement of a garment, both when standing and seated. Make sure you can lift your arms, across your arms and your legs, generally pick up something from the ground. You need comfort and mobility, more than your fashion trend goblin would have you think. Screw comfort, just buy it. Go on to number seven, which is fabric selection. What fabrics should you be looking for? Of course, this depends somewhat on climate, but it also is heavily relies on your lifestyle. So let's get a general breakdown. After watching this video, I hope you're going to be cursing me from your open carts because you have to check so many things before you buy. It's a good thing. I'm going to link a nifty fabric chart below so you can reference it when you're shopping or at your leisure. Ultimately, the fabric chosen for a garment has a big impact on the overall look and function of that garment. A tailored jacket in silk with no lining versus a wool jacket with a lining has two different feels, fit, and aesthetic weights. Generally, you're going to find two different types of fibers, natural fibers and man-made fibers, and both may have a place in your wardrobe. Let's start with some of the major fibers and fabrics you'll come across and how they will best fit into your closet. First up, we have everyone's favorite, cotton. It's lightweight, versatile, absorbent, easily washable, can be dyed, and doesn't static cling. 100% for that. However, it does wrinkle easily and can shrink, so those are its pitfalls. You can see on my chart all the common fabrics made using cotton here. And ultimately, cotton will be found in a wide variety of garments within your wardrobe. So, except that you'll probably have cotton in your wardrobe. Silk. It's lightweight, soft, drapes well, and has a sophisticated luster to it. However, silks can be expensive and easily damaged. They can show water spots, sweat stains, snags, or even get damaged by sunlight. Silks are often used for blouses, dresses, scarves, linings, and jackets. Next up, we have wools. They can be anywhere from light to heavyweight, and they are great for bulk and warmth. They hold their shape generally well, and they don't wrinkle. 
However, they can be prone to moth damage, shrinking, pilling, and they can take a while to dry. Because the wool has so many different weights and weaves, it can be used in everything from shirts to sweaters to coats to suits to jackets. So again, you'll probably have wool in your closet. Next up, we have polyester. Polyester is a low cost fabric that has easy wash and wear quality. It's wrinkle resistant, it dries easily and quickly, and is often fairly resilient. However, it can fill, be non-absorbent, and can feel uncomfortable or not breathe in hot climates. And depending on the quality, it can stretch or stain after a lot of use. Polyester is often seen within lower cost goods, but is becoming more popular with retails for cost saving measures. It's used in a lot of linings as well. Nylon, it's great for strength, wrinkle resistant, and a lower cost item. And you can see it used in practically every garment in your closet from lingerie to sweaters to jackets. If this is getting a little bit overwhelming, start checking the labels of items you already wear and love and jot down the fabric blends to reference. Number eight, clustering your closet. Organizing your closet and purging your closet are incredibly important aspects. Now, I highly encourage you to only have the current season in your closet at one time. And the more you can see your wardrobe and the essentials within it, the more you can cluster for your lifestyle and simplify your outfit pairings. Mix and match functionality without the overwhelm is one of the most sought after closet goals. The concept of a cluster can be used in two different ways. One to separate out two disparate parts of your wardrobe. For instance, if you have business formal wear for work, but a cool, edgy, casual weekend look, you want those pieces to have two separate spaces in your closet. The second is to do it by pairings. For instance, you can group pieces that all work for a certain color palette. While you may keep your neutral separate, you can visually select, let's say five to seven pieces from your wardrobe that all pair nicely with one another and cluster those together. Let's see what it looks like in my closet. As you can see in my example, there is a print, color, and texture relationship between all these seven pieces. We have two tops, one tank, one dress, one jacket, one skirt, and one layering piece that could generally be used to mix and match with each other and add in a neutral bottom like jeans or a trouser and I'm good to go. For me, most of my pants lean neutral, so I don't include them in the clusters, but your wardrobe balance or color palettes may be different. By visually separating out some of these clusters, we see the most obvious pairings and harmonize our pieces ahead of time. From my example cluster, let's see the different outfits I could easily throw together. <music> I could have easily continued on with that cluster and made at least five more outfits. The larger that your cluster is, the more outfits you should be able to get out of it. The system won't work for everyone, but it can be a valuable training wheel to start training your eye to mixing and matching and seeing what the outliers are within your closet and how everything harmonizes together. How focused is your closet? Because after you cluster enough, you might look at that mixed floral chaotic love of a dress just a tad differently. I love it, but it's an outlier. And just to note, these are your clothes. So while it is great to get inspiration from others for new ways to put things together, don't forget about your body, your lifestyle needs, and your style parameters. Trust me when I say this, Bella Hadid has different needs than you most likely. So file the inspiration into a folder, but don't be boxed in by it. Clusters can help you make your own unique pairings and we want our own voices to shine. And if you're a planner, I have a cluster worksheet linked below to help you organize the relationship between each pieces. And after clustering, you may see some wardrobe gaps that need to be filled. And guess what? They can go on your shopping list so that you can again start this process back at step one. What did he say? Hey. Oh. Hey. Number nine, spending with confidence. Okay, so I'm sure you feel like I just overcomplicated a historically easy process. See item, add to cart, buy. But Gabby has to make it difficult. Overconsumption is at a high, personal style is seeming harder to pinpoint, and the ease of online shopping at our fingertips. Our wardrobes and styles are the ones suffering. So I'm not trying to take the fun out of the shopping part. What I'm trying to do is put the fun back into your style and the expression part. Once you start paying attention to these elements, they will become second nature, I promise. Not only will it save you money and time and improve your style, but it will also be a system you can use at any age and at any point or wherever your personal style leads you. Okay, so those are the nine steps. I hope this video has been food for thought and has been enlightening you to the next phase of your style journey. Until next time.